welcome back to the Cordell and Cordell and Men's Divorce Podcast. I'm Scott Trout, CEO and Managing Partner of Cordell and Cordell. And as we continue to bring you the latest information as it relates to COVID-19 and its uh, direct impact on all matters of family law before, during, and after divorce, uh, we continue to do that. And as you know, I start out each segment making sure you understand that this is an attorney-client relationship, that we're not going to give you advice. We just can't. Uh, the facts and circumstances of your case would dictate something different, likely. And so we encourage you to seek out uh, the advice of an attorney, one that really just practices it in family law. I think that's as important. We continue to say that. And if it's not us, obviously, it's someone who just does family law. But if you want a consultation with us, obviously, you can seek us out on the web at cordellcordell.com or 866-DADS-LAW. We can do them via telephone or virtual uh, and in person where appropriate uh, and where health and safety are our priority. So again, seek us out. Today, uh, I'm joined to answer questions that were submitted online uh, by Kyra Ramey up in Ohio. Welcome, Kyra. Thank you, Scott. Good to be here. So as we do each week, uh, we'll take the number of questions, and we usually get just to a few that have been submitted that weren't answered at the virtual town hall on Thursdays, and encourage you to not only tune into this daily podcast, but to turn into the, the town hall on Thursdays where you can ask your questions live of the panel and get answers. So let's uh, just dive right into it, Kyra. Uh, Randy asked uh, at the town hall, and we weren't able to get to it, um, if your ex-spouse is cohabitating with a man for over four years, do I still have to provide alimony, uh, maintenance, spousal support? So I guess some of the things that obviously I know you'd want to know, and as I read that, I would want to know is kind of what the decree says, right? And maybe we can talk about the forms of alimony, and that will help Randy understand Maybe he can look at his decree and get a better understanding. What There are two types of alimony, really. What are those? Okay, so when we're talking in um, Ohio about uh, spousal support, we're talking about an order that is uh, made by the court to allow a certain level of living to occur once the parties are divorced. So we have spousal support level one, spousal support level two, where the court talks about a certain monthly amount in the level one category, and then a level two category is typically a division of property um, that still allows the um, former spouse to have additional funds moving forward. So we deal with both, but obviously the level one support is um, much more prevalent. Um, and so the first thing we would wanna know is whether or not your decree allows the court to hear um, a post-decree modification or termination of that support. Um, and so we would want to know if your decree says that the court retains jurisdiction over that issue or if the court does not retain jurisdiction. And what that means is if the court does not retain jurisdiction, then a, a person who's paying spousal support must continue to pay that amount and cannot uh, petition the court for a change. If the court does retain jurisdiction, it may be as to amount and duration. So the amount, you're asking about cohabitation. So in Ohio, cohabitation does not automatically terminate a spousal support obligation. Um, if we want it written into an agreement, then that's what we propose, and sometimes it's accepted, and sometimes it's not. The court will not typically order cohabitation as a termination, but it can modify spousal support. So that's what we want to know um, is available in your decree. When we talk about cohabitation, it can be sometimes very difficult to prove because now everybody knows how to live with somebody and not get caught, basically. So we look for things like, is there a utility in the boyfriend's name? Is there a rental property in the boyfriend's name? Are there bank accounts that have the boyfriend and the former spouse's name on it combined? Um, and many times we look for a private investigator to give us that information before we can properly advise a client on what to do next. Yeah, and I imagine, you know, it, let's make for assumption that it's a modifiable for Randy. That's something he can change because typically, as you suggest, these level one, level two for us in Missouri and Illinois and Georgia, where I'm licensed, you really look, it comes down to, is it a fixed term that it can't go up or down, can't change, can't eliminate, or is it an open-ended term where the court, as you suggest, retains jurisdiction based upon a, what we would call a change in circumstances? So the, I guess the question for Randy would be that I assume in like, for example, in Ohio, that the cohabitation, albeit it isn't uh, 
something that terminates or, or modifies, but it's a factor that you have to prove up? Yes. So I think similar here in Missouri where uh, there could be language in decrees that talk about cohabitation would be similar, like kind of a pseudo remarriage that may right. serve to terminate, but it's certainly influential. You want to look at you know the contribution of a boyfriend to the living expenses. Those are the things that I think that would drive down the need, because that's really what it comes down to is, right, that the, the, the standard for alimony and a modification is a continuing change, and then they evaluate the continuing need in Ohio? Yes, that's correct. And another factor, Scott, that the court would look at, let's say in the decree, yes, there's a big disparity in incomes, but maybe the court ordered former spouse to seek work, or they may be imputed a certain income to her with that expectation. Mm -hmm. So four years, yeah, he's asking after four years, four years down the line, if she still is not employed, but is maintaining a certain lifestyle, then there are, are some assumptions that a court could draw from that in terms of the contribution she's receiving from a third party. In Ohio, does Randy's ex-spouse have a continuing obligation to seek further education, training, improve work, you know, whatever it may be in order to continue to be eligible for the spousal support? It's, there's no um, continuing obligation to pursue um, mm -hmm. education or experience, but there's a, an understanding. If, if a judge orders somebody to seek work in Ohio, and then there's a modification motion that comes before the court. If that person has not attempted to do anything, then the judge can impute a certain level of income to that person based on what they should have been doing during that period of time. Right. So let's talk about Randy. Let's just say Randy meets some of the factors to modify or terminate, and <clears throat> the decree allows him to do it. And we've been talking about this for the last 10 weeks about mod modifications. And in Ohio, what is the line of demarcation? We talk about retroactivity, meaning that they, that really is in most guys' best interest to get filed quickly so that they can kind of set that line to say, okay, once the relief is entered at some point in the future, judge, I want you to look all the way back to this point and give me credit if I'm entitled to a decrease. What is that in Ohio? Yes, so that's that's basically the same principle in Ohio. So it's it's not a good idea to wait, to sit around while financial situations get worse and worse, because what the court's going to look at is when did you file this? When did you think it was a need, a financial need for you to get the court's attention to intervene on your behalf? And so once you file a motion, that's the date in Ohio that the court will go back to to modify spouse support or child support, so long as you prove your case in terms of the spouse support obligation. Okay. Let's go on to Dale. Dale asks, and again, we'll try to add some what we think the facts are. Dale says, with a marriage of seven and a half years and no mutual investment property or kids, every attorney, every attorney I've trusted failed to attempt to ask that my personal property be returned to me and stated flatly that all the property in my ex-wife's possession will most likely be awarded to her. Uh, uh, Dale's disabled, a disabled vet with cancer. Uh, it's been locked out of his house. Uh, what does it take to be able to retrieve lifelong collections of firearms, jewelry, coins, watches, and antiques in my laptops and my files to support my request? And so, Dale, I mean, I know that's an, uh, I'm curious what you think, Kyra, but it is kind of the things, one of the 10 stupidest mistakes guys make, and I've talked about this, and that is one of an inventory of your own personal property, yes. uh, things that you bring with you. And if you want it, you need to ask for it specifically in your decree. There's this, you know, and I bet, Dale, kind of what the advice you're getting, and it probably the first attorney that drafted it may have failed you in this regard. And, and Kyra, I'm curious to your thoughts. There's this catch-all provision in what I would call standard judgments, and that is that the property is awarded to the, you know, the person who's in possession of it if it's not specifically stated in the judgment. And so it's kind of this catch-all where, you know, most of the judgments don't go all the way down to individual towels and individual spoons. And so there are big things that you ask for specifically, like your firearms, your jewelry, your coins, you would want that to be specifically outlined, right, Kyra? Because otherwise that catch-all provision is probably somewhere buried in that judgment. And that's what they're relying on is, hey, you didn't say you wanted it, so it's mine, it's in my possession, right? Exactly. So when we have a case that's resolved by an agreement, um, if we put in language and the catch-all language in our jurisdiction is all property has been exchanged and divided, period, 
that tells the court there's nothing else to argue about. So if somebody were to file a motion claiming they didn't get what they were supposed to receive, that would be dismissed. Mm -hmm. um, and they would probably have to pay the other party's attorney fees for bringing that type of motion. So we always want to make clear that you must have a complete inventory because some, some guys come in here and say, this is all I want. This needs to be done. This is all I want. And it's a list of five things. And it's usually guns, tools, and a car or something of that nature. And then it's not until later when you thought that this issue was resolved that, oh, yeah, I also wanted this. I also wanted that. I didn't know you meant that she could keep my personal effects, the things that I collected over the years. All those things must be listed out. And if we ever have a doubt that that has not been properly done, then we make them make a big inventory of everything, go through the house, list everything in each room. And if you guys can't reach an agreement, then we're going to flip a coin and we're going to put, you know, D next to dad's name, M next to mom's name or husband or wife to indicate who is taking what and attach that list to the final decree. Yeah. It's a tough one because it, I'm very specific, and I think the attorneys, that's one of the things they overlook. Two things. One is the possession item. If you don't list it, you're not going to get it. I, I say this every time I do an in-person seminar. It will be burnt. It'll be left outside. It'll be sold on eBay, given away at the Facebook marketplace. It's yes. just gone. Yes. But more importantly, I think what's overlooked is the value of these, this property. Yes. You know, we're talking about when you value personal property and many attorneys just overlook it, it could be $10,000, $20,000. And this is a windfall for wife. And yes. so I think, you know, it's easy for attorneys to just say, sorry, you don't get it because of the catch all. But I, when, if Dale, if you're listening you know, watching, I encourage you to seek counsel because there may be some other provisions in your state that talk about fraud, mistake within yes. a certain defined period of time. Sometimes, for example, in Missouri, it's a year that you could seek relief. Maybe, you know, there's supplemental documentation that suggests that, that you were do this and your attorney just forgot to include it or that, you know, it was on the record and you testified in court that you were going to get this, but it's not in the writing. That would be called uh, in Latin terms, nunc pro tunc, which is that, you know, even though the testimony stated that you were to get it, the, the written part didn't conform to that. So it would be kind of a clerical error and that is, there's relief for that. And there's an undefined period of time typically for what we call nunc pro tunc. Uh, but I think, Dale, just it's worthy of just a, a quick consultation. You don't got to spend thousands of dollars to go get some advice. Uh, seek out an attorney because, again, you just list some items that seem to be pretty valuable. But, you know, you know, the devil's in the details. And we talk about details, especially representing guys, right, Kyra? Yes, absolutely, because some of those things are forgotten or left behind. So that's yeah. what we're here. We educate them. Yeah. So, you know, it's a tough one for Dale, but definitely seek, uh, seek advice. Or if you're a guy that has a similar situation, you're about to go through it, uh, make sure you list out every single thing. If, if it's not in your possession and you want it, it better be detailed in that judgment. So that's kind of the lessons learned. For some dads out there, the coronavirus pandemic has become a pretext to limit access to their children. Other dads have been pushed out of key decisions affecting their children's lives. If you're one of those dads, Cordell & Cordell is here for you, as always, but with expanded services. We can meet you in person or by video conference on weekdays, evenings, or weekends. Our goal is to step up our service to meet your needs now. Um, Richard asks, my daughter turned 18 recently. Uh, she's homeschooled uh, through an online program. Uh, due to COVID, North Carolina came out and declared all seniors that are in good standing as of a specific date will receive a pass uh, and basically graduate. Uh, Richard called this, this uh, university or this high school program and they said that uh, his daughter has a 91 average and is 97% complete with just a few remaining assignments in order to graduate. Richard pays child support, um, but he called and they could not give him a definitive answer on how this applies to his daughter in terms of termination, I guess, at age 18, um, because she doesn't go to North Carolina school per se. Uh, the question really becomes, he's on a wage assignment, he's paying automatically out of his pay. Um, he doesn't know what to do. Um, so I guess that's really the question. It's He's called Administrative Child Support Enforcement to try to get help. North Carolina, obviously, 
has an emancipation age at 18 and, or upon graduation from high school, whichever is later. Uh, what is Ohio's emancipation age, by the way? It is 18 unless you're still in high school. So if okay. you're still in high school, then it's 19. Um, but that is sort of the final um, age that Ohio looks at unless there are some special circumstances with children who need additional help. Um, so for this situation though, um, in Ohio, the public school district um, still has sort of jurisdiction over the kids in that district, whether they're homeschooled or have another online program or some charter school. So what I think needs to happen in this situation is there needs to be documentation from the homeschooling program that is then submitted to the public school district where the child lives. Um, that can confirm through the school district that she has in fact completed her credits and is officially a graduate. Then I would submit that to the Child Support Enforcement Agency. If the agency still doesn't do anything, which I, I think they should at that point, um, then it would be a motion asking the court to recognize that the child is 18 and a recent graduate and to terminate that support order as of the date she was 18, since that's the later date. Yeah. I mean, I even think in Missouri, for example, um, I, we would say, go file a motion to quash the wage assignment and a motion to terminate your child support. Uh, make sure you allege that the child's birth date and graduation date per se. And then that, that's what we call a rebuttable presumption. Now it turns over to mom uh, to state why the child's child support should continue, whether you know that you know could be special needs, uh, for whatever reason, may be that the child wasn't able to graduate because of COVID, but I think those are the things that you immediately file again, because you're looking back to the date of filing to terminate. So even if you're paying forward, you maybe do a refund, uh, because it'll be effective as of that that kind of that 18th birthday or the date of uh, graduation. So there are kind of two things I would be filing quickly. Now, COVID may um, interrupt the ability to have these hearings, but I know that um, we spoke to one of our North Carolina attorneys a couple of weeks ago, and they seem to be taking uh, court actions pretty regularly, at least via Zoom. And this is a perfect kind of a uh, case for Zoom, where it's a motion that probably lasts 30 minutes. Right. Uh, pretty sta you know, straightforward stuff, um, unless mom's making some uh, allegations that the child isn't em emancipated because of you know medical needs or uh, psychological needs. So uh, definitely it's a, an issue by by which you should be filing those two motions. Uh, and I guess retroactivity again would apply in Ohio too? It would. And this might be a situation also if, if uh, Richard is quick to file such a motion that mom might just say, look, I agree. There's no need to mm -hmm. continue the support. Let's just sign an agreed entry and file with the court. And then you can also be done that way. So yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll turn into something that is um, has animosity in it. So that might be a way to resolve it as well. Yeah, and it's kind of Richard may be in a bad situation. And I encourage Richard to hey, send a letter certified return receipt requested to mom that says, hey, my understanding is daughter is now graduated, turned 18, my child support stopped, I've overpaid by a month. Will you consent to the termination and refund me the money? And I can just foresee mom saying, sure, I'll consent to termination, but I'm not sending you the money back. Yeah. You know, and, and so now Richard's because yeah. you know graduation costs and the party and the <laughs> yeah. Now Richard's got to say, okay, do I hire a lawyer for a thousand bucks and trying to get five hundred back? And, you know, it's a cost benefit analysis, and you know, you do risk whether or not the court's going to award fees, and it's a possibility if mom, for no reason other than being litigious, withholds that money, she yes. might be able to pay your fees. But Richard, that's I mean, first and foremost, seek consent. You know, in writing so that you have proof that she received it and then she doesn't respond it just goes more to you getting your fees back potentially it's a good foundation to ask for them. yes agreed so i think that's all the time we have for these questions today kyra thank you again for your uh, great input uh for the answers that guys really want to hear no problem scott i enjoyed it so as always continue to tune in uh, and then also on thursdays remember make sure to ask those questions live of our panel you'll get answers and if not you can submit those questions to coronavirus.divorce at cordelllaw.com. And each week we'll address these questions and give you answers in this video and podcast so that you can uh, get those to you. So uh, tune in again every day and each Thursday for a virtual town hall. And look us up online at cordellcordell.com or 1-866-STATS-LAW if you'd like a consultation with one of our attorneys. Until next time, have a great week.